John Updike is one of our most prolific writers. He has published nearly 50 books, including works of fiction, poetry, and criticism. Of the many characters he has created, there are several he keeps coming back to. It has been 16 years since we were last in the world of Henry Beck. Now, Updike revisits this alter ego in what he calls a quasi-novel. The book is called Beck at Bay, and John Updike is back. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Why are you smiling? I thought you were going to say Updike is also at bay. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, is he? You know, <laughs> you uh, know, what is it about you that keeps you... I mean, you are, as I said, not only prolific, uh, but there is... There is there is, is it, is it a work ethic about you, or is it you love doing it, or is it somehow you think that you can't look back because it may be gaining on you? Something like that. <laughs> it, it's all I do. All I do is write. I mean, I yeah. don't teach. I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't play golf much anymore either. So if I can't produce a book a year, I'm not really doing anything. Also... Wait, wait, wait. Stop right there. If you can't produce a book a year, you're not what? Finish that sentence. You're not what? I'm not doing the job. I'm not earning my place on the, on the planet Earth, I figure. I figure, you know, a book a year is the least. I, long That's time ago, just setting out in this strange trade, I'd vowed to produce a book a year, and I pretty well kept that. Now, I know. Now I could taper off, but I still have a few more books I'd like to try to get out there before I fall silent. Can you Everybody tell me what is. they are about and who, where, where, what direction they are before we get to this one? The, Which is next, a collection. the next one is just a collection of criticism. I do a certain amount of it and it piles up. Mm. And now, you know, about every eight years, if you don't harvest it, you get too big a book to publish. So this would be a big book of mostly essays. So that's easy, though. All you got to do is put them together. It is easy, but to try to read them and make them a little better and uh, uh, proofread them. So it turns out to be not totally easy, but yes, it's basically easy. Then there's a novel I'm trying to do, uh, but is not easy for me. It's kind of a historical novel. And if I talk about it on this show, it just may tip me over the edge and I'll never do it at all. Oh, God. But uh, it is a challenge Set to... in America? No. No? No. Denmark, I think. I think it's what, Denmark. Do you think it's Denmark? Think Contemporary it's Denmark. or historical? Historical. Historical. Yes. What century? Just what century? Um, 13th. Oh! <laughs> Century I know nothing about, nor do I know much about Denmark, but yeah. uh, anyway, I feel, I feel compelled to go there. Yeah. It'll be a short novel, uh, if I indeed complete it at all. Does criticism bother you? Somewhat. Yeah. Somewhat. I try not to be bothered by it, but in fact, it, uh, it sort of, some of it sticks in your, in your tough old hide, yes. Yeah. But I would think by now, I mean, you've seen the best and the worst of it. I mean, you know, you've had people love everything you do, and then, then people not the like opposite, everything you do. Uh, Yes, yes. I, I'm not as uh, open to uh, taking a wound as I was when I was in my 20s. When I was in my 20s, I thought, isn't this wonderful that I'm writing yeah, and publishing and, it all? And they're talking about me. So how can they jump on it like that? <laughs> Why did they want to kill me, I yeah. said to myself. It yeah. was very hurtful, but now I know. And now you have a, what, I, but you have, what? now you, it bothers you a little bit, but you take it in your stride and say, I've survived all of this and with Pulitzer Prizes and the like. I've had my share, perhaps, of good things, so I yeah. shouldn't complain. But I found, for those of your uh, viewers who care, that if you file a review, a bad review, it helps. Just put it in that file uh, folder and put it in a drawer, and somehow it loses some of its potency to, uh, to poison your life. How does that happen? I don't understand the process. You put well, it in a file, meaning yeah, that, that you, you, the you act put of it filing in a place. It? Yes, you've kind of buried it, I think. I think it's a symbolic burial. Yeah. It's like a murder and a burial, and then you don't have to consult it. As long as it's floating around from one desk to another, it still has its sting. Anyway, oh, that's just a tip, a tip you didn't ask yeah. for. Well, and, that's, uh, that's, uh, okay. <laughs> how come this, it's taken you how many years? 16 years since we have talked about uh, Mr. Beck, Henry Beck. I thought I was done with him. Yeah. Uh, uh, but there was one story I did write after Beck is back, the second book. Right. And uh, I wanted to, I thought that story needed enough brothers uh, to make a book so I could preserve it and in that sense put it into the past, put it on the record. So I, a summer ago I sat down and tried to write some new Beck stories and wrote enough to make a book in my mind and uh, that's why it's called the quasi novel because it was almost like writing a novel in that I sat down and wrote and thought about Beck continuously. It wasn't just a harvest of short stories written over years. Do characters in different books of yours talk to each other? Uh, rarely. That is, does Rabbit Angstrom ever yeah, talk exactly. to, to Henry Beck? Yeah, exactly. uh, 
No, they're different compartments, and they do different things, and even evoke a different style. But uh, I have had a Henry Beck story, not in this book, but in another, in which he does go to Pennsylvania. So that's about as close as he comes to meeting Harry <laughs> Angstrom. He inhales the Pennsylvania magic yeah. and uh, doesn't yeah. much like it, as a matter of fact. He's, he's less charmed by Pennsylvania than, than I am. What, what do you think of literary criticism today, just generally? It doesn't have a dominating figure or a revered figure like... Uh, like Edmund Wilson, Wilson right. and uh, everybody always says Edmund Wilson. I know we are another lame brain of this, or Lionel Trilling uh, right. uh, is another example of a revered critic in his way. Alfred Kaysen, I think, was the closest yeah. we had recently to that kind. Died, of, years recently ago. died, and uh, we don't have too many critics who are willing to take on all of, say, American lit. Now Kaysen was. Kaysen had a broad reach, a big bite, yeah. and so he did try to write about the whole thing from the Puritans on. Uh, most. Uh, Critics now, including myself, are really reviewers. We'll tackle yeah. the book in front of us, but uh, don't have any vision of an extended treatment or to rearrange our concepts of what's good and bad the way T.S. Eliot did. Uh, to rearrange our concepts well, of what's good Elliot, and bad. Well, Eliot was, in his casual way, quite wonderful at putting down established reputations. He thought Milton wasn't really much good at a time when he was automatically revered. Then he thought the metaphysicals were quite good at a time when they were thought to be minors. So Eliot is the last critic I can think of who really changed the way we read. And that, I guess, is what a critic would like to do, is change the way we all read and re-evaluate established reputations. I don't know that critics have that mission today, do you? No, I mean, what, I wonder what their mission is. I, I guess know. it's oh, to I, make a living and yeah, I think so, <laughs> to get probably. by and uh, get a little name for themselves. Um, here in the New York Review of Books and the New Republic, and but uh, yeah, there's not that uh, idea of making it new. Ezra Pound said, "Make it new, make literature new." What Maybe well, he just wanted to revise the whole thing. Yeah. Pound came and Eliot at a period when Victorian literature had become tired. Uh, the poetry looked tired. It was so let's do away with it all and begin afresh. It'll be interesting to see if the end of this century produces a similar mood of somehow disposing of a vast corpus of work and beginning afresh. Or maybe we'll begin afresh by disposing of all written, written stuff. Too okay. much trouble. Too hard on the eyes. Okay. Who needs it? You know, I can hear that being said already. Oh, I can too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I assume you'll rise to the rebuttal. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I'll try to defend because the world of print's been good to me and I'm thoroughly at home in it, but uh, not everybody younger than I is at home. I was the last, mine was the last generation that didn't really have television to heavily distract them. Yeah. And, uh, What's the so process we like for you? Process of writing. writing yeah. Well, you try to have an idea or two ahead and the idea you have at hand, uh, I try to rise early and go upstairs to my office and work on it for three or four hours, three, more than four probably, and advance the manuscript, three or four pages, and in that way, <clears throat> move along until you've produced a book. So then what do you do Very for the simple, rest of the really. day? You know, I wish I knew where the rest of the day has gone to lately, but what I used to do is I would either play golf if it, the weather was fair, or I would help around the place, or I would repair something, <laughs> or I don't know, I used to do a lot of things, and now all I do is seem to answer letters, Mostly saying, no, I don't want to do something, but even that takes some energy. So there's a great deal of, of unproductive uh, desk work in my life. If I could think of a way to eliminate it, uh, I'd so, be happy. So would I. I mean, yes. I mean, I keep asking myself, I mean, even as, you know. In you a get a lot more attention no, well, than I do, no, too. But I mean, uh, just, I wish there was a way to eliminate it, you know, because you feel some way to, I mean, some way to get through it, some way to handle it better. Yes. Are you essentially today, because you and I have done this lots of times, as you know, and I'm flattered that you come back. Uh, are you essentially a happy man? Uh, yes, I think as men go, I'm quite happy. <laughs> versus what? Versus yeah. women? Versus <laughs> animals? Versus... I can't speak for women too authoritatively, but, uh, but men, I think, uh, there's some troubles with being a, a male animal of this species. Uh, you know you're going to die, which other Before animals... Before the women, too. <laughs> as it turns which out. Which is true. Uh, death hangs over us because we have such big brains, and uh, there's also <laughs> also a wish to explore the next meadow. I mean, there's a, a lust for 
more mm -hmm. and onward and uh, a feeling of entrapment uh, in circumstances. All that, I think, plagues, plagues uh, people. Uh, how close have you come to achieving your potential? <laughs> I think I've uh, maybe, uh, how about 87%? <laughs> do you I really think, think 87, about 87 is about it, huh? Uh, I think I could do a little more if I'd been a little uh, more uh, intense or serious. There's something kind of, uh, I wouldn't say lazy, but possibly flippant about me that may have closed me out from the remaining 13%. But I've certainly done better than I would have thought or than our neighbors would have thought back in Shillington. <laughs> or even my father's thought. My father was amazed that I was making a go of this. It all seemed to him like craziness, <laughs> trying to write, really. So he could he was, not imagine, uh, could he? No, he couldn't. He really couldn't. He was a child of the Depression. I mean, he wasn't a child of the Depression. I was a child, but he was a man of the Depression who had lost yeah. his job. And so he was running scared all his life. And uh, So was my father. Yeah. Yeah, and that, the my, my father wasn't that a, too, yeah. my father came of adulthood in the depression, you know. Yeah. And and, Bad and time. always mm -hmm. ran scared about that. And right. I, you know. Never borrowed money after that. Always paid cash for everything. So for me to under about everything. <laughs> then we had the same kind of father and to undertake something as as risky, as chancy, as strange as writing. I mean, selling a luxury product that nobody really needs. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, struck him as I'm kind not of, convinced they need a talk show either. Oh, no, we need, we need those talk shows, but books, so we can take them or leave them. <laughs> Tell me who Henry Beck is. Oh, Henry Beck's a guy, a man, a man I invented some years ago when I wanted to write about being a writer. He's not He's uh, as unlike me as I can make him and still be able to reach him. He's older, <laughs> he's older, he's Jewish, he's unmarried, he's unprolific. Yeah. Uh, and, suffers from writer's block. And he loves New York and he lives in New York. Yeah. And he suffers writer's block, all those things. None were, of those uh, is you. Not really, yeah. not really. But nevertheless, I feel a great affinity with him and I'm happy to write about him. When I enter into Henry Beck, uh, I feel at home in some way. Maybe he's a self that I left behind when I moved from this great metropolis, I don't know. But so anyway. you left Henry behind when you moved to... I left him here to watch over things. <laughs> <laughs> He's done a good job, don't you think? Yes, uh, on yes. Balance. <laughs> yes. All right. uh, now, the, the, let me talk about something. One of the stories is Beck and Czech. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's that? He goes to Czechoslovakia in the last days of the, com of the evil empire. Yeah. Uh, communism still reigns in Czechoslovakia. He consorts with the dissidents. He consorts with... Ap Ap Apparatchiks, is yeah. that the word? Apparatchik, yeah. And uh, he, he pretends to be a writer. In fact, he is a writer, so he poses as a writer. He gives speeches, the kind of thing I used to do when the Cold War was still on. And he becomes frightened. He becomes frightened because he is Jewish and he feels around him all the Jews who aren't there. That is, the Holocaust to him is a live presence. It's a live absence, right. let's say, absence of all those others. So he feels fear and uh, panics kind of and descends his mind descends into a patch of czech czech language mm -hmm. which is meant to be kind of darkness i mean because most of us can't read it czechs can right. the rest of us right. Right. so that's the story of henry beck it was a long story of uh, 40 pages or so and i was surprised that the new yorker took it under robert gottlieb yeah but i thought hey this is nice <laughs> this is nice of bob <laughs> yes and so it's always been in my mind as a worthy story yeah. so i began this book with it uh beck the reason you now understand why I asked my question early on about literary critics, uh, Beck Noir. Well, that, again, I was in the middle of this Beck project, and uh, the Library of America got out a two-volume edition of Noir writings from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I read around in it, and I suddenly said, why can't I write a Noir novel? Yeah. I'm full of black thoughts and a potential <laughs> depressive, yes. if not an actual depressive. <laughs> So, uh, oh, I, I Henry Beck will be my hero, so I made him into a killer, yeah. Killer. What does he kill? Critics. <laughs> not, not talk show hosts. He does, he does. I know. <laughs> he does, he... So what are we expressing here, <laughs> Mr. Updike? A lot of, a lot of hidden rage. Hidden rage, uh, right. Yeah, it is yeah. hidden rage. Hidden rage, right, right. Old Have you ever read anything where you... Festering. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Have you ever, ever wanted to kill a critic? 
Often. Often. <laughs> no, really, quite often. They're, they're, after all, trying to kill you by... Yeah, they sure the rubbing hell you are. out, you rubbing you out. Yeah, and they're trying to take food off your kid's table. That's right, exactly that. They're you trying know? to make my kids starvelings. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. And uh, you can kill for that. So I'm really killing, not for me, but for my kids. For your children. <laughs> and not my grandchildren. <laughs> quite so. <laughs> you, um, has that stirred any controversy, the fact that you, all this rage is now out for the rest of us to see? A little stir, insofar as there can be much literary <laughs> literary stir these days. Yeah, there, oh, there, was, there, in, in was, our... <laughs> there was some interest in this particular story uh, that, yeah, that, that he would actually go out and do what many of us have just wanted to do. <laughs> but he does it. He's an old man. He figures he can perform this service for the world of eliminating evil critics from it. <laughs> yes. He even gets a cape like Batman. Thank you, John. Thank you. John Updike, Beckett Bay, back in a moment. Stay with us.